Solamente una palabra, solamente una oración, cuando llegue a tu presencia, oh Señor. No me importa en qué lugar de la mesa me haga sentar, o el color de mi corona. Si la llego a ganar, solo déjame mirarte cara a cara, aunque caiga derretido en tu mirada, derrotado y desde el suelo. Seguiré mirando mi maestro cuando caiga ante tus plantas de rodillas. Déjame llorar pegado a tus heridas y que pase mucho tiempo. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, 'cause He's never.
hold you today. Just like those the people walk, walking around when you came in on a donkey. Pronouncing to you Hosanna in the highest. We thank you right now, God. For that which was to come. The sacrifice you made. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body
today. Let's give him a great offering. God, thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, just have your way in this service today. We pray in Jesus' name. everybody. Welcome to Axis Church. For those that don't know me, I am Josh Garner. I am one of the deacons here at Axis Annapolis. Wow, this is going to go great. Nowhere to go but down. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time or visiting us online, uh, we would love to get to know you better. There are, there should be connect cards around here on the chairs. If not, there's some on the back table. Uh, feel free to fill one of those out, uh, drop it in the offering box, and someone will reach out to you. And if you are online, uh, you can go to accessannapolisorg slash contact, and someone will reach out to you there. Uh, again, if you are visiting, welcome. Uh, as a matter of hospitality, we do have bathrooms in the back, as well as coffee and pastries. Do we have fruit today? Fruit snacks. Fruit snacks. Uh, well, Easter is upon us. It's coming up next weekend, Sunday. Uh, we've been talking about access missions and how we are called to be a church mobilized. We don't necessarily all have to go overseas to do that or to be a missionary. We can be missionaries right here uh, in our own neighborhood. So we're mobilizing access, especially this Easter, by simply inviting people to the banquet. We've already been hearing great stories from you guys about how you're inviting classmates, neighbors, and people to our special Easter service and series. Uh, remember, God wants to, f to fill his house. We're on mission to invite all to his banquet. If you need more cards, please pick them up on the Connect table in the back. Um, you can send them out via social media as well. And uh, if you need any instructions on how to give out a card, let me know. It's pretty easy. I hand out business cards all day. It's just you go. Welcome to Axis. Um, so yeah, there's three ways to let people know. One is just going up to your neighbors, your friends, inviting them with a the card. You can go up to strangers, or again, you can uh, post it on social media. Let them know that Axis does love them. We're looking to make Jesus the center of their lives and to invite them to, to the Easter service next Sunday. With the Easter Sunday, we are having a special lunch after the service. Uh, we're asking for people to volunteer so that we can prepare and have enough food for everyone. So if you could RSVP by tomorrow, let us know how many guests you're expecting so that we can plan accordingly. That would be great. Um, there was a link that was sent out, or you can go to accessannapolis.org slash Easter, and that would help us out tremendously. And kids, bring your Easter baskets. If your friends are coming, make sure they bring their Easter baskets. Uh, there will be um, prizes for those to grab, so make sure that you come. And let's see here. Holy Week. We all got a text, I think it was a text, or email yesterday from Jorge um, to follow a devotional together. It's on the Bible app version. That's a pretty popular app. If you don't have it, uh, you can just search Bible app or version, and you can download it or click the link that Jorge sent. Um, and on there, uh, it'll be a daily devotion that we'll be going through as a group together for the Holy Week, starting tomorrow. I clicked on it this morning. It works pretty easily. It'll say, Jorge's inviting you. Do you like Jorge? Do you want to follow Jorge's message? And you say, yes. Yeah. Um, so that's it for Easter at the moment. Uh, today we do have two classes for the kids, uh, babies and kindergartners. And also we have one for the older kids. Today, however, not just first through fifth. We're going to go first through as old as you want to be. And there's going to be a special Easter escape room thing. So right after the announcements, we're going to dismiss the kids to class. 
and right through the door. If you have not signed your kids up yet, we'll sign you up over there and we'll get you taken care of. So a quick thanks for all those that have given uh, to the church, to Axis. Thank you to all those that have been giving to the missionaries uh, that are going on mission uh, in a few months. Um, there is an offering box in the back. If you'd like to give today in person or online, you can go to accessannapolisorg slash give, and you can um, contribute there as well. So we're all going to stand up for a moment. We're going to stretch. And the only thing I could think of was... I thought it was going to be warmer today, so I was thinking about flowers, but it's cold. So we're still thinking about flowers and what's popping up in your garden. So you can talk to your neighbor about what might be your favorite flower that you see coming up. Well, good morning, Axis. It is so good to be together one more time to continue to inspire one another to make Jesus the Axis or the center of our lives. Amen? If you're new at our church, we're glad you're here whether you are with us in person or online. And we would love to get to know you better after the service or just email us online, check us on our social media, and let's connect. We're excited to continue our Easter series titled Broken. You know, uh, we've been uh, talking about uh, the passion of Jesus, the sufferings of Jesus. Today we're going to uh, actually uh, make a pause and, and reflect upon the meanings and the uh, teachings of a special moment in Jesus' journey to the cross. That is what we call Palm Sunday, right? Jesus' entry to Jerusalem to be crucified for our sins. The title of our sermon this morning is going to be The King's 
compassionate love for a lost world. And for that, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. If you can meet me there, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. You guys know how we roll around axis. Most of the time, we basically just work verse by verse through entire books of the Bible, sometimes selected scriptures like today, because we don't want to miss we don't want to miss any of the good news God left behind for our edification in His Word. So Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. I'm going to read it, then we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into our message this morning. It goes like this. And when He, Jesus, has said these things... He's been teaching a lot. The last teaching was about the 10 minus in the context of chapter 19. And after saying these things, the text tells us, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem to be crucified for our sins. Verse 29. Verse 29 and when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you find a cold tide, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. Verse 32. So, so those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had, he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near to Jerusalem, already on the way down to Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying this, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I'll tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Verse 41 and when he drew near and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in of on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you, you did not know the time of your visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray, church. Lord, we worship you this morning. And we thank you for your word. We pray that you would use it mightily this morning to remind us. about the fact that you are the king of all creation. But you are a compassionate king that hurts for the ones who are far off from you. Challenge us. Lord, encourage our hearts through this powerful word, we pray. 
In the mighty and beautiful name of Jesus, amen. Powerful, powerful portion of scriptures. Very symbolic day today. Palm Sunday. Jesus, triumphal entry into Jerusalem as he is on his journey to be crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. In, in this beautiful text, we're going to see how uh, Jesus is received in Jerusalem as the king. And we're going to see how he, he is a compassionate king. And we're going to be moved by his compassion, but also challenged to imitate it in our own lives. In, in short, uh, I want to propose to you this is what we're going to be learning from this beautiful passage. That again, Jesus is a compassionate king who hurts for a lost world and desires for everyone to be saved. Are you ready for this? It's beautiful, beautiful, powerful portion of scriptures. Uh, let, let's take it from the top. Uh, Jesus is king, right? Uh, this is the first scene we see in this beautiful text. The king's arrival into Jerusalem. Verses 28 through 38. In your Bibles, we see how uh, Jesus, the text tells us, is near Bethany, he's coming from Jericho, actually the beginning of chapter 19 tells us. And Bethany is this town, this little town that is right there in the borders, the, the entry point to Jerusalem, approaching the Mount of Olives. And then there's this crowd awaiting for him, chanting this. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He is the king. He is received as a king. Now, not a usual king. Remember, before he enters into Jerusalem, he sends a couple of his disciples to get a donkey, right? And it's just super interesting. I, I, I like those cool details in scriptures, how Jesus tells them exactly where and how they were going to find the donkey. The disciples go, and it happened exactly how he said it, right? And the owners of the donkey were like, well, what are you doing with our donkey, man? They're like, the Lord needs it. <laughs> and they were like, okay, take it, I guess. <laughs> And they took it. And then Jesus rolls into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Very interesting. That, that tells us, that communicates to us that Jesus is a humble king. Right? He's a humble king. He's not a flashy uh, king. He, first, he wanted to communicate to humanity, to humankind that he... First and foremost, is a kind and loving king. Now, one day, he's not going to come on a donkey. And in humility, he's going to come on a horse and in authority. Amen? But first, he want to make sure that we know and understand that he is a humble king. And... The riding of the donkey, actually, and this whole scenario, this whole picture we see, this whole scene, actually has another powerful symbolism. And is that this was the fulfillment of a prophecy given to the Jewish people 800 years before the times of Jesus. In the words of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, he said, Rejoice greatly, O, o daughter of Zion. Every time you see Zion in the scriptures, it refers to Jerusalem. Uh, Shout out loud, o, o, o daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he humble and mounted 
on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The people of Israel are seeing this scene, and they're going, wow, this is exactly how the prophet Zechariah and many of the other prophets have said it. It will be beautiful, beautiful. They're going, this guy is the king. Prophesized. Chanting. I don't know what's going on. Maybe confetti. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know maybe some LED light. I, I don't know what's going on. Some rice. No, that's for weddings, right? I don't know. <laughs> the big celebration. Because the king's arrival. And you know, in, in, in scriptures, every scripture has one meaning, different applications. One meaning, different applications. And uh, this scene uh, is not the exception, right? It represents the entry or the arrival of the king into Jerusalem. It also represents the arrival, uh, or it points to the arrival and the second coming of Jesus in the future where he is going to fully establish his kingdom on earth. But follow me here. This is important for us. It also represents and it points to the king's arrival to our lives. Do you remember when the king arrived to your life? I remember it was uh, 1950. Oh, <laughs> no, it was uh, to the, was it 1998. I you forget about it. When I placed my faith in Christ for the first time, that was the king's arrival moment into my life. And perhaps there's some watching online or here in person who ha have not experienced that yet. And, and, and Jesus is calling your attention to remind you that he is arriving to your life, perhaps today and and he is to be there in our lives every day not only when he arrives but then he stays there for the rest of our lives and what do we experience when when that happens when we receive him as our king and we give him the place of a king in our lives uh, let me suggest to you that from this beautiful text, we can draw a few applications in that sense. Number one, that we are to embrace Jesus uh, as our king. And you know, the, ki the word or the title king carries a lot of powerful implications. A, a king is, is one that rules over a nation, and it is to rule over our lives, right? A, a king is a, 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 a one before whose authority we surrender our lives. And the big question here is, is Jesus the king of your life? If he is arriving to your life, if he is knocking on the door, if he's approaching to your life, are you aware that Jesus is the king? And if we've done it before, are we aware and conscious of this every day in our lives? Are we giving him as the people in Bethany did the place of a king in our lives. Number two, uh, we are to worship him with genu genuine joy. You see, these people are receiving Jesus with palms and, like I said, confetti and probably some horchata, I don't know, <laughs> celebration, big time. For those who don't know what horchata is, a Salvadorian drink is the best drink in the world. <sighs> They're celebrating, they rejoicing for the arrival of the king. What, what do we experience in our hearts 
when we think about Jesus being our king. What do we experience in our lives when we, when we come to church on Sunday morning and, and we sing these songs that we sing? Is there real, real joy in our hearts? Is there real uh, that, that euphorious joy happening in our inner beings? Or we're like, eh, I can't wait for worship to end so we can get in the Word and then get out of here. That happens. That happens sometimes. When we're riding in our cars and we face the uh, decision whether to listen to worship music or something else, we're like, eh, nah, I don't feel like worshiping right now. Do we have that genuine joy in our lives daily because we are constantly celebrating our king. And then another application for our lives is, are we sharing about our king with others? You see, if we, if we, recognize if we embrace that he is our king and we have genuine joy in our hearts because we know that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and there's no greater life than a life of worship to our king then we will be motivated naturally to invite others into this life, into this worship, into his kingdom. Amen? Like I can imagine the people there celebrating the arrival of their kings, their king. I can see them telling everybody around Bethany, hey, come join us. The king is coming. Come join us. Join the party. Join the celebration. Join the chantings. Amen? That will be something natural uh, to do. Last uh, weekend was it St. Patrick's Day? Downtown Annapolis was full of people celebrating St. Patrick. I would love, I long for the day the church is not afraid to fill downtown to celebrate Jesus and invite everybody to the party. Amen? When we do these things, when we live this way, we embrace He's the King, we worship Him with genuine joy, and we're constantly inviting others to celebrate the arrival of our King, then we know. We're making him the king of our lives. And at the same time, something powerful happens. We transform the world. We impact the world with the power of the gospel. We impact the world with the worship to our king. More people come into his kingdom, more people recognizing he is the king, more people worshiping with genuine joy, and the world around us is being transformed. Now, someone might say, well, I'm not into impacting or changing the world. I can't, you know? That's like big words, you know? And everybody nowadays is like, yeah, I don't want to talk about Jesus, let's not get into, let's not use the J word, you know, let's just, because what difference would that make? Well, I love how uh, preacher and pastor Charles um, Spurgeon uh, said it, regardless of 
our fears. We need to value him above all things. We need to give him the kingship of our lives. Because if Christ is not valued at all, I'm sorry, because Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all things. Are we giving him the kingship of our lives? That's a big question. In this first scene, in this beautiful text. Now, second scene is the king's compassion. See, first scene, the king's arrival. Second scene, the king's compassion. We see in verse 41 in our Bibles that he finally makes it to Jerusalem, probably looking at it from the Mount of Olives, and he weeps over it for two reasons. Number one, because he knows the judgment that is coming upon Jerusalem soon for their rejection of the Messiah. Verse 43 says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon other in you. If you know the prophecies, you know that there's prophecies of wars and many nations surrounding Israel and making war against them and wanting the first war until Jesus comes back for the second time and he establishes his kingdom on earth and redeems them and, and defeats all their enemies, all his enemies, and put them as the footstool of his feet. Psalms 110. But because of the rebellion of his people, judgment is coming upon them. And Jesus is there looking at Jerusalem, knowing that it's coming, and he weeps. He cries out. He hurts because he is a compassionate king. Number two, he weeps because they were not ready for his visitation, the Messiah, the king's visitation. Right? It says it right there in verse 44. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. If you keep reading, actually, in the context, you'll see that they were actually uh, trading uh, goods and making money at the temple. We meditated on this account last Sunday. And they have traded uh, their worship to God, which was the reason being of the temple for their worship to their idol money. And Jesus is weeping because he sees this. They were not even thinking about the king's visitation. And when he said who he said he was, they rejected him. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own people, and his own people did not, what? Church, receive him. I, I want us to get into this sentiment. Jesus is weeping because he knows the judgment that is coming upon Jerusalem, and they were not ready for the king's visitation. But here's the kicker. Follow me here. This is so important. Jesus does not get angry. He weeps. 
he weeps, he cries, he hurts for these things. Why? Because the Lord is compassionate first and foremost, and merciful, slow to anger, and filled with unfailing love. Amen? Have you ever thought about how God feels when you and I do something wrong? When we go astray, if you're a little bit like me, my first thought is, oh man, God might be so angry at me right now. But this text is telling us that is not the case. God's first reaction is weeping. It's compassion. Because we are away from him. Remember the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? How the father was hurting because his son went away and wasted his inheritance and reckless living. And then when he saw him coming back from far off, he starts running towards him with compassion, the text tells us. And receives him and hugs him and, and he's celebrating because the one who was lost has been found. is back home. Amen. Now, from this beautiful text and this particular point, the king's compassion for the lost. We, we must reflect, church, on this powerful truth. We need to first and foremost recognize how deep, how unfathomable, how in Explainable is God's love and compassion for his people. The maximum, the ultimate expression of that was the cross, right? He didn't come to judge us. He came to save us. He said it. I, I haven't come to judge the world I have come to rescue the world and give my life as a ransom for many. Right? Even when Jesus would say words like repent and believe, I want us to realize he's saying these words not with anger, but with weeping in his heart. When Jesus said, Turn away from your idols and come back to me. He's not saying these things angry. He is saying these things weeping. When he calls us out in our daily lives, when we go astray, and perhaps he's using a word, a brother, a sister to call us out on that sin in our lives or that behavior in our lives, or that posture of the heart in our lives. I, I want us to remember in those moments, God is not angry at you. He is weeping and he's calling us back to him out of love and compassion. Amen. Now there is a place for God's wrath. But that is because... That's what we deserved. But God is slow to anger. He is delaying the time. Have you ever thought about why it's been 2,000 years and he's not come back yet? Because he's making time for more and more to be saved. Have you, have you ever wondered why is it that he has not consumed your life and my life? Because if you think of it, if we're honest with ourselves and we think about all the things we do and think, like, really? Like when someone comes to me and exhorts me and tells me, like, Jorge, you know what? I've noticed that you, you are like this 
and that's not pleasing to God, I go, oh, bro, in my mind, you don't have an idea. It's actually even worse than what you see. I, 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 I'll take criticism because in reality, I'm going to go, it's even worse than what you can see. I do a great job kind of, uh, you know, dissimulating things, covering things up in terms of my ego and my anger and my pride. It is worse. I'm so prideful. I'm so, and despite of all that, and despite of all that, God is loving and compassion to me and to all of us. How do we respond to his compassion? I want to submit to you. We are to respond with gratitude. You know, oftentimes we don't, we think about these truths in scriptures and we go, yeah, yeah, cool God, thank you. Thank you for being gracious, merciful, compassionate, awesome. But we're really not valuing it. You know, sometimes we do the same things, the, the same thing with people around us. People around us sometimes are being kind and loving towards us, and we respond with, eh, with nothing. We don't, we don't respond, we don't, we don't um, you know, share kindness and love back to the people who show kindness, show kindness and love towards us oftentimes. And we do the same with God. But we are to respond with gratitude. You know, the Bible says that his mercies are renewed every, every morning. Shouldn't we say thank you, Jesus, every morning? Because of that, just that very little truth right there. But now we, we wake up and we go on with our days without even thinking about God's mercy and compassion for us. Church, the book of Malachi says that if it wasn't because of his grace and compassion for us, we would have already been consumed by his wrath. Are you tracking with me? He's giving us time. He's giving us grace. He's extending us so much compassion. And we are to respond with gratitude. And lastly, we are to replicate his compassion with those around us, especially with those who wrong us. Right? The same way we wrong God more often than not, and he gives us compassion and mercy. The same way he wants us to imitate this attitude in him, extending compassion, mercy, and forgiveness to those around us. That's the way the world's going to know we are his disciples. Perhaps someone watching online or here in person this morning needs to hear this. Perhaps someone needs to extend mercy and compassion today to someone in your family, at your workplace, in your community. Just as Jesus extends compassion to us. Check out how Mother Teresa said it. I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Those little touches of grace we give to the people around us. Those little touches of compassion we we exercise on a daily basis will transform the world around us. And people will go, wow, there's something different in Jorge. There's something different in Robert. 
there's something different in, in Susan. I, I can't understand how after everything I've done to her or to him, she or he continue, continues extending forgiveness and compassion to me. And the outcome of that is that more people will embrace Jesus as their king. They'll believe that there is power in Jesus to transform the heart. More people will come to him. More people will come to Jesus if the church would just be a little more kind and compassionate to the lost. Amen? And that is the king's desire. And this is the last scene we see in our text. Remember, first scene, the king's arrival. Second scene, the king's compassion. And lastly, we see the king's desire for everyone to be saved. Remember, Jesus is there weeping for Jerusalem. And he says these words, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. In other words, Jesus is saying, I wish you knew the things I am going to do that I are going to make peace between God and man. But no, you rejected me because are hidden from you. And follow me here. This is so important. Why are they hidden from them, from the Jewish people, from the religious people? Not only back then, but today. D did you know that? Things are hidden from people so they ca can't understand the gospel they can't understand the compassion. They, they cannot found, they cannot receive the good news of the gospel, the things that make for peace between God and man. Why? Because their eyes are closed. And why are their eyes closed? Oh, because God decided for that to be the case? No. Look how Jesus explains it. In Matthew chapter 13, for these people's heart has grown dual. And with their ears, they can barely hear. Now check this out. And their eyes, they have closed. Who's closed their eyes? God? They themselves have closed their own eyes. And this is a powerful principle. God never closes, let me say this again, God always closes, or God only, I'm sorry, closes the eyes of those whose hearts they hardened before. Does that make sense? It happened with Pharaoh in the book of Genesis. Text tells us that he hardened his heart, and then God hardened his heart from understand the words of Moses. Isaiah chapter 59. The result of this is the way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads or no one who walks on them knows peace. They don't know the ways of peace. Remember how Jesus told his disciples, everywhere you go, first thing I want you to say is peace to you. Because that is the message. The gospel is the message of peace. How Peace is reached, is done 
between God and man. In Romans 5, Apostle Paul would say, now it is through Jesus that we have peace with God. That's a reality. Why many can't see the ways of peace from God. But that doesn't mean that God's desire for them to be saved, for their eyes to be opened, remains. Look how uh, Paul was seen in his letter to Timothy. He said, this is good, Timothy, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Who? What church? What is God's desire? For everybody's eyes to be closed. For some people to have their eyes closed and some people have their eyes open. For all, for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, God desires for those hearts who have grown dull to give up and surrender before God. And when that happens, our eyes are opened. Amen? And we are able to see the ways of peace. We are enabled to understand and receive the gospel of our King Jesus. We are able to receive Jesus as who he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is why the Apostle Paul would plea to the people of his times. He would say, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal to us. Listen to this. We beg you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why would the Apostle Paul beg people and plead to people with this intensity for them to repent and surrender? Come out of their dual hearts and surrender to Jesus so their eyes may be opened. Now, do you notice the intensity of Paul? Paul is not saying these words with anger. He's saying these words with compassion. And I can almost see Paul weeping as well here. The same attitude of Jesus the same love and heart and compassion and mercy of Jesus displayed in the words and the life of the Apostle Paul so to th wrap things up this morning I just want to leave you with a couple thoughts here God is pleading to us Reconcile, come to me. Not only the day of our salvation, but daily. He wants us to seek reconciliation with him. He wants us to receive the good news of the gospel. He wants us to have our eyes opened. And reconcile with him. This is God's most deep desire. What is the king's desire? Is for people to reconcile with him. Amen, church? But then, as we said at the beginning... God also wants for us to imitate his compassion for those around us. How do we do that, church? By becoming ambassadors of the message of peace. Amen? That's what Paul was just saying. Me, as an ambassador of Christ, I plead, please, I plead to you. God wants us to become ambassadors of the message of peace, of the message of the gospel, imitating his compassion, sharing his compassion, sharing his love, sharing his mercy with everyone around us. And this is very timely. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. 
And you know, we've been putting out, out this challenge. Go to the roads, go through the gates, remember? And invite, 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 as Josh was telling us during the announcements, invite everyone to the banquet. God has so many blessings prepared for everyone, for all. That, that we are to go, man, God's blessings are too good not to share. So we put out this challenge. Invite three people you know. Invite three strangers you run into. And share the invitation three times online. The invitation to our Sunday gathering next Sunday. Let's go, church, and become ambassadors of peace. And as Pat joins me in the background, let us reflect on this during this holy week. Church, as we meditate on uh, Jesus' arrival to Jerusalem and he's received as our king, he is uh, displaying his compassion for Jerusalem as a way to express his compassion for the ones who are far off of him. And as we are challenged to imitate his compassion in our daily lives, let's surrender our lives under his kingship. Let's be grateful for his compassion daily. And let's become ambassadors of the message of peace. Amen, church. Let's pray. Jesus, we pause this morning to thank you for your compassion towards us. We pause to recognize that you are our king, a good king, a humble, merciful, merciful king that we are to imitate on our daily lives. Move us towards that kind of light, Jesus, we pray. As we reflect daily, you did for us the ultimate manifestation the ultimate expression of your compassion for the world for each and every one of us was the cross that day at Golgotha when you gave it all for us who don't deserve it Jesus, make that expression of compassion and love for us on the serving sinners. Move us to worship you, live in gratitude, and imitate you. Let's rise up, church.
for our good king. What a beautiful word this morning. Before we wrap it up, I want to encourage you to do something new today. So you know how after the service, we all start breaking things down immediately because we want to get out of here. I mean, we, we have something else to do. Um, I want to encourage you not to do that. To take 10, 15 minutes, relax, connect with someone you haven't talked to in a while. Ask them, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? And enjoy some fellowship and community. Now, when you see this on the screen, see if it works. Yeah. Then please give us a hand to break things down. Amen? Okay, let's do it, church. We'll see you tomorrow. Be encouraged. Let's go and be ambassadors of our king. Amen? Have a blessed week.